Good afternoon, everybody. I'm James Hughes and I am going to be talking to you this afternoon about uh, cases in road traffic, employers liability and public liability that I think you need to know about that have been decided this year. So I suppose title should be recent cases in those areas that you need to know about. Liability has been keeping the courts busy as far as the general issues are concerned. And we're going to look at two RTA decisions, one employer's liability decision and, and four PL judgments. All but one of them are decisions on liability or, to, or contributory negligence. One is, is a quantum only case. For the most part, they are decisions of high court judges or deputy high court judges. So I'll kick us off with the case of Brian Leonard and First Manchester. This was a judgment on appeal to Mr Justice Friedman in the QBD in Liverpool. It, it, in essence, it is a defendant's appeal asking the court to reconsider the evaluative judgment of the recorder who found uh, for two thirds of the claimant's claim on liability. He, the claimant, was walking along King Street in, in Manchester to what, what is effectively a, its crossroads with Brown Street. He, the claimant, wanted to, oh, sorry, he, the claimant, wanted to go back or to cross uh, over King Street so that he could proceed along Brown Street. And the defendant's bus was coming in the other direction or I should say traveling in the same direction as was the claimant. In the opposite direction was the the third party, a third party's stagecoach bus. The they needed to pass each other and the defendant's bus driver accordingly veered ever so slightly to the left towards the mouth of Brown Street, either just touching or just passing over the white lines on that junction. And about the same time, the claimant was in the process of crossing Brown Street. And, and as he did so, he turned to his right, effectively attempting to cut the corner to cross King Street without pausing or looking to do so. And he walked in front of the, the buses, the defendant's buses front left near side, just as it was passing the mouth of Brown Street. Uh, and he, he, the claimant, was thrown to the, the ground and suffered a nasty injury to his head. He couldn't, he, the claimant, couldn't recall the, the events prior to the accident. And so the recorder had to decide the case by, as I say, coming to an evaluative judgment, which principally he decided looking at the CCTV footage from the defendant's bus. The claimant did call a witness from the bus, but the court below found that it wasn't assisted by that evidence. The defendant's bus driver, so the recorder found, didn't avert his eyes from the bus coming in the other direction. That was an important finding, as you'll see. As I've said, the recorder found for the claimant as to two thirds of the value of his claim, so found him one third contributorily negligent. And the defendant in the appeal said, in a case where a trial judge has to decide by such an evaluative judgment, it, it's open to the appeal court to look again at the CCTV images and decide the case afresh. And Mr Justice Freeman rejected that. He found that's not what the appeal court's role is on a review of a, a decision of the first instance judge. Rather, it's the defendant's burden to show a gap in logic, a lack of consistency or a failure to take into account some material factor undermining the cogency of the recorder's conclusion, he said. And that, that was in doing that, he was restating the number of, of the kinds of authorities which you will know about what the appellant has to do or to show before the appeal court interferes with a 
finding of the recorder or the first instance judge, the trial judge. And Mr Justice Friedman said, no, there's, there's no problem with the recorder's judgment because it was unsafe for the bus driver not to have averted his glance from the, the stagecoach bus coming in the other direction. And so as even if omen, only momentarily to have spotted the claimant in the mouth of the junction, which the recorder found uh, what he, the claimant, was a very real hazard to be encountered. And Mr Justice Friedman agreed with that. Just pausing there before we look at the case of Farrow, what, why do I think that the Leonard case is important? Well, it's important because it's a restatement of the, in my view, high hurdle which a, which an appellant in this case a liable defendant would have to surmount before an appeal court is looking to would look to with the findings of a trial judge and and the defendant went further than that in circumstances where the trial judge had to come to an evaluative judgment on evidence which wasn't oral evidence or factual evidence, but rather it was CCTV evidence. Farrah is a case which I, I think is useful in that it's a very close analysis of what a defendant will have to show so as to prove a novus actus interveniens, i.e. something which breaks the chain of causation. It was a decision of Mr Justice Linden sitting in the RCJ and you'll see uh, senior counsel arguing both for the for the claimant and the six defendants, Rob Weir QC for the claimant, William Audland for, for D2, Derek O'Sullivan leading Michael Standing for the fourth defendant and Tim Horlock for, for the fifth. So I, I don't think that the authority of this decision could in any way be doubted. It, it's important factually as well, it, insofar as the trial judge, Mr Justice Linden, broke down the events surrounding the accident into four causatively relevant phases. The claimant had been drinking and he was with a group of, of men who were scuffling in the street in the early hours of the morning in London. And the, and the first defendant, who it's right to say had been previously convicted before the civil trial for an offence of uh, causing harm by dangerous driving. In effect, I think he was there were a number of counts on the indictment, but he, he was sentenced to some three or so years in prison he, and he deliberately drove his Ford at the group. They took evasive action and the claimant sustained in that first phase a right tibia fracture. And there was an issue as to whether that injury was caused by his being struck by the Ford in the first stage or whether he sustained the injury, that injury later. And as the claimant was looking to avoid the Ford being driven at him, it, he ended up on the front of the Mercedes, the second of the two vehicles involved, which had stopped just behind him and accelerated away. And the claimant ended, ended up spread eagled on, on the front of the Mercedes with his body over the windscreen and the bonnet. That, that didn't injure him, but there was a subsequent issue as to whether the Mercedes driver who was allegedly the sixth defendant, was intending to cause harm to him and, and whether the claimant had jumped on the bonnet. And in the third phase, the, the Mercedes accelerated away to about 27 miles an hour, but then it broke sharply. The claimant was propelled backwards from the Mercedes and onto the ground where he undoubtedly suffered an L4 vertebral fracture. The other issue which or other the, the two key issues which the court was asked to decide was whether the claimant had jumped off the car and in the, the course of which whether it was during that phase that he'd suffered a DAI a diffuse axonal injury to his brain it, most importantly in my view it, the the Ford in the the fourth phase was again driven by the first defendant deliberately at the claimant who was lying on the ground and it struck the claimant at about 20 miles an hour and and drove with him for a further 33 meters down the road with him with him the claimant underneath the car and, and inevitably he was left with severe and multiple injuries so the preliminary issue was directed 
to Justin Linden to determine liability and causation as between the first defendant and his insurer, the second defendant, and the driver of the Mercedes and his insurer. And Mr Justice Linden found that on the issue of causation, it, the first defendant caused the tibial fracture despite the fact, after having driven on the first occasion deliberate at the claimant, despite the fact that it was the Mercedes driver who tipped him into the road, because the court found those were deliberate and intentional actions using the car as a weapon, which caused injury to the claimant's right tibia. And because of that, so the court said, importantly, I think he was deserving of, of less latitude than would have been afforded to the quote, merely negligent, even though the Mercedes driver's actions were also deliberate. And the court said phase one and phase two were a closely connected sequence of events which took a, a matter of seconds. And it was fair, the judge found, that, that the first defendant should be liable for the phase three injuries. The driver or driving of the Mercedes, the court found, did not eclipse or obliterate the first defendant's actions or render them purely historic. That's important because the court went on to find that, that the first defendant's deliberate act of driving into the claimant a second time, so that was when the claimant was lying on the ground after he come off the bonnet and windscreen of the Mercedes with the deliberate intention of, of injuring him on a second occasion, that the court found had happened 40 to 45 seconds after the claimant had hit the ground after he'd come off the Mercedes bonnet. And again, the first defendant was using his vehicle as a weapon. And so the court found that they those actions obliterated or eclipsed what had gone before so that D2 would be liable to compensate the claimant for all of those injuries. So there was, the court found, a break in the chain of causation as to what the deliberately driven Mercedes had done as, as far as the claimant's injuries were concerned. And it's important, it seems to me to know, this, this is a, a careful analysis of the, the judgments, which are the cases which are relevant as to what is a, a, a novus actus, what is something which breaks the chain of causation of injury. It's Simmons and British Steel Core and, and IBC and Clay and TUI, you'll see there. But moving on to employers liability now, a decision of Sir Robert Francis QC sitting as a Deputy High Court judge in the case of David Harris and Bartram's haulage. Again, it seems to me a decision whose authority or of some pretty persuasive authority, it's a High Court liability trial with Gerard McDermott QC for the claimant and again Derek O'Sullivan for the first defendant and Andrew Davis for the second. I think it's important because it, it's the High Court having a look at what the defendant employer is required to do so as to discharge itself of the burden of the reasonably prudent employer in a case where a failure to risk assess and to train is pleaded by the claimant. And he, Mr. Harris, was employed by the first defendant. The second defendant was self-employed and ran his own transport business with a tractor unit. And the second defendant's tractor unit had been driven to the first defendant, the employer's yard, and an articulated lorry and the trailer, so that's the tractor unit uh, and the trailer, rolled over the claimant who was employed to drive it. And importantly, the claimant was described as and found to be a trained and experienced lorry driver. Th there wasn't any dispute as to how the accident had happened and, and its cause. 
namely that the brakes of neither the tractor nor the trailer were applied at the time and the court was asked to decide how that state of affairs had, could come about and who it, it, if anybody was responsible for it the the trailer brake i should say the trailer parking brake had come to be disengaged while the claimant was connecting the trailer to a red susie that's the the coil lock which you may have seen which connects the cab of an articulated lorry to its load usually a trailer behind it uh, one of the questions of fact with the, which the court had to decide was was how it had come to be disconnected and the judge canvassed three possibilities there it, it was left disengaged on the claimant's case by the second defendant the, the self-employed haulage driver again on the claimant's case by an unidentified helpful stranger and you you can probably guess where the court went with that argument or it was left dis disengaged by the claimants himself as was the case of both the defendants and the court found that D2 doing the opposite of what his training experience and, and motivation had told him to was the least likely of those things and it also gave short shrift to the argument that it, even a helpfully minded fellow lorry driving stranger would have interfered with the brakes without telling the claimant that, that was what he was doing. And as I've said, the court set out its task as being an assessment of the measures that the reasonably prudent employer should have taken, should have deployed to keep the claimant safe. And he, he said, he found that the scope of that duty incorporated, encompassed foreseeable events, including mistakes that could be made by the employee, particularly if such mistakes were known to occur. Such measures are likely to include training risk assessments and provision of appropriate equipment to address the risk. And he went on to say, you got the quote there, that the, the duty of an employee, employer, sorry, to their employees is not confined to such measures as would be taken by any prudent employer, but will include such measures as they're actually aware of or should have considered as part of a risk assessment. I suspect that's not telling us that much more than what you would already think to be right anyway, as far as the steps the employer should be taking. But the importantly, I think, in some help, some observations which I think are helpful to an extent to defendants in cases like this one, the court found that the claimant, by reason of his training experience, had a full understanding of the need to apply the brakes of the tractor and the trailer one of the allegations which he had made is that the yard was on a slope and that that made it inherently more unsafe but the court found that he knew about that and he also knew that that his vehicle was equipped with warnings and alarms uh, as they the court in the judgment had described them and he, he was a fully qualified and trained lgv driver and had demonstrated that competence before the accident and unsurprisingly i think the the first defendant the employer was entitled to take that into account that knowledge and experience when it was considering the steps it needed to take to keep him safe and they they the employer had implemented multiple measures to guard against the risk of the load rolling on to the claimant and he'd been trained he was experienced in applying those safe procedures every day the lorry unit had a warning and alarm which went off when the handbrake wasn't applied and the judge found that couldn't have been more explicit to use his words and there was a double precaution of of requiring the brakes of both the tractor and the trailer to be applied before the susie was disconnected so that that the judge found to be a considerable number of fail safes which had to be overridden but before the claimant's accident could have occurred and so you can probably see where this is going that they they the employer despite having failed to adequately to provide an induction training to the claimant or, or indeed to adequately to risk assess the yard uh, was or neither of those breaches were found to be causative and factually the, the second defendant was found to have applied 
the trailer brake before leaving it on the yard. It, so just pause there. I, I think that's a, a firm restatement of the this judge saying, well, even if you prove that there was a failure to provide adequate induction training or indeed to, to risk assess the the area of work. You've still got to prove that both of those breaches in the Section 69 era now, and I, I mean that after the coming into force of the 2013 Act, you've still got to prove that both of those breaches are causative. They weren't. And in any event, the judge was against the claimant on whether or not the second defendant had applied the trailer brake. Uh, had, it seems to me interestingly enough, and I think importantly, this is also a, a case where the accident circumstances were so obviously dangerous in, in light of a claimant who was experienced in the task which he said had gone wrong, was such that had the claimant established a liability, he would have been 80% con contributory negligent. PL now, and, and this is where the, the courts this year ha, have found a, or been asked to decide issues of liability. Before I go on, go on to the decisions that chart, which I want to look at, I should say, a, a by way of postscript, it, are any highways lawyers listening to you? Uh, Matthew White. Uh, and indeed uh, our own Ben Handy as well had success at first instance then on appeal to the High Court and then again to the Court of Appeal uh, Matt representing the claimant Mrs Barlow uh, in the High Court and Court of Appeal respectively and Ben at first instance in, in the case of Barlow and Wigan and, and, and that's a more technical uh, decision on a discrete uh, area of highways law which in narrow terms is whether a highway authority constructed a highway in its capacity as a highway authority and whether the highway has been dedicated at common law. I hadn't enough time to fit that into this presentation, but it's if you are, if you do do highways work, whether for uh, claimants or uh, highways authorities and their insurers, it's one to look at. And in, indeed, I should say that it, it, David Forster uh, helped both Ben and Matthew uh, in the course of their various successes in that case. First of our four PL cases, Brian Morrow and Shrewsbury. That's a decision of Mr Justice Farby. It, it's a, our only quantum case and the claimant was injured when he, while he was watching a rugby match, one of the goalposts fell on him. A, an accident for which the defendant accepted its liability and so the issues were causation and quantum. The claimant's case was that he'd suffered a brain injury which caused the resurgence of his previously existing epilepsy and a new somatoform disorder. And he said that that somatoform disorder caused him to be fatigued, stressed and anxious, such that he had to give up his pre-accident job as an independent financial advisor. And the, the major part of his claim was for past and future loss of earnings consequent on psychiatric damage. And the defendant's case, represented by Geoffrey Brown, it, it asked the court to find that this was an unreliable claimant uh, without, I should say, uh, inviting it to make a finding of fundamental dishonesty because there was a significant correlation between the, claim, the claimant's pre and post accident presentation and that he wasn't materially, materially, I should say, less able to work than he would have been, but for the accident. And, and that it would be unfair to award damages for the effect of the claimant's own belief that he'd suffered a brain injury, when in fact he'd not suffered a significant injury beyond the short-term effects of being struck over the head. But as far as the impact of the accident was concerned, the court found the claimant's evidence unreliable in a number of significant respects. He had, as the defendant had invited the court to find that he had, downplayed his pre-accident history of physical and psychological difficulties so as to dramatise what had happened to him after the accident. But despite that, the court found that he had suffered a loss of hearing, uh, 
taste and smell, tinnitus, uh, three years of a benign paroxysmal positional vertigo and a resurgence of his pre-existing epilepsy. And I, I, my own part, the, the epilepsy is the the key to all of this really as far as the award which the claimant received. And the court found that the resurgence of his epileptic seizures was not directly caused by the blow to the head, but rather by sleep and mood disturbance, which was attributable to the psychological effects of the accident. He'd had a somatoform disorder before it, and it didn't cause him a new psychiatric condition which caused him to work. It was more likely that it had brought his pre-existing psychiatric problems to the fore. Importantly, I think this judgment bears reading for the court's approach to the the future loss of earnings claim in particular, because as I say, the, the defendant had invited the court to find that it had, had been exaggerated by reason of the claimant's pre-existing psychological problems. And it, his work as an independent financial advisor had caused him stress. But the court said, and th this it seems to me a, a, an important restatement of the, the eggshell personality rule in Page and Smith, it made him vulnerable to greater psychiatric injury than than otherwise would have been the case. And he had suffered a severe somatic and psychiatric reaction, did cause him to lose his sleep, and he'd had a number of, of further seizures. And the more som general somatic disorder caused him to be overwhelmed by his work, such that he probably would have only worked until he was about 55 years old. I also think this is a, a, an important case to look at in quantum terms as to the kind of psychiatric injury or the severity of the kind of psychiatric injury which you will need for a substantial or a sub more than substantial award of general damages. All of that which the claimant suffered, the court found, was worth £58,000. The, the claimant's counsel had contended for an award of 60. And if you read the judgment, Jeff Brown for the defendant didn't put up too much of a fight there, it would seem. But his past and future loss of earnings were calculated up to the, the age which he would have probably stopped working in any event. I should say as a postscript to that judgment, the on the cost decision, the claimant was penalised to the extent of 15% for having exaggerated his future loss of earnings claim. I, I break down just to clarify again because I think it's a helpful judgment insofar as it's the High Court examining the claimant who claimed for a number of different heads of loss. He hadn't made out his claim for loss of congenial employment because he hadn't provided enough evidence to show that he actually enjoyed his work or as an independent financial advisor or that, or that he found it satisfying. So I, didn't, I wasn't particularly surprised by that but it didn't strike me as being one of the kind of classic roles which or vocations which the claimant would normally throw into the mix to say that they had enjoyed before the accident. And as to the other heads of his loss claimed, a not insubstantial sum for four four thousand three hundred pounds of personal care, a bit more or a bit less than eleven thousand, I should say, for professional case management, which the court found had been engaged reasonably based on his experts, experts guidance and then further significant awards for occupational uh, and psychological therapy and for, for tinnitus retraining. And as I've said, th this isn't a, or wasn't a case where the defendant ran FD. You, you may well have thought that it, it, it might have or could have with a straight face, but it, it, J Jeff Brown chose not to run the case that way. But the claimant was uh, penalised for inflating trial costs. Wells and full moon events and Dave Thorpe. This a off road or off roading day accident, a, a liability trial before Michael Bowes QC in, in the RCJ. He's sitting as a deputy high court judge again. Uh, leading and junior counsel for the claimant and defendant on both sides, Ben Brown leading Anastasia Carceras for the claimant and Graham Elkland and Stephen Inns for the defendant. So again, one of these 
cases where you could with a straight face say that it, a judgment reached after careful argument with senior counsel on both sides. Claimant sues the defendant off-road motorcycling centre. It's a claim in negligence. He'd been racing during an enduro day, quotes, albeit that it, it, it's non-competitive or a non-competitive kind of racing. You're led by an instructor and you're doing 20 miles over varied terrain. The trails are often muddy or puddled and the route which the riders took depended on the ability of the riders. It, it, importantly, the claimant who in evidence described himself as an experienced and competent off-road motorcyclist had completed a signing on form and indemnity, acknowledging that motorsports were hazardous and accepted the risk of participating in Endura Day. So it's, it's a race, but not a race. It's an endurance event. And the itinerary for the day said that it, it would be tough and challenging while always safe. I mean, that's, that's my own view there that the defendant by its documents doing no more than, than stating the obvious, but the claimant when he was riding in single file chose to, despite his experience, ride through a muddy puddle. Again, you might think something which would, it would happen in the ordinary course of things during a an enduro day where the terrain was acknowledged to be muddy and wet, all part of the fun of the experience, it would seem to me. Ne nevertheless, the claimant claimed that the, the front wheel of his motorcycle struck an object concealed under the water, causing him to lose control, fall and sadly sustain what were undoubtedly severe and catastrophic injuries. That, he said, was the both defendants' fault because uh, they were negligent or they'd breached an implied contractual term to it. And the kernel of what he said was that they should have carried out a risk assessment in relation to the particular byway and the instructor should have given guidance about how they should negotiate the, the byway or the, the obstacles and particularly warned him about the presence of submerged obstacles in, in the puddles. The defendant denied liability. They said the claimant accepted the risk put him to proof of the circumstances of the accident and went further and said that they didn't owe any duty in respect of obvious risks. So the, the Tomlinson and Congleton BC line of argument. And the court found that the claimant had failed to prove he'd been struck by a submerged object. The instructor in front of him had, had ridden safely through the puddle and its likely depth was between 8 and 12 centimetres was such that the claimant's motorcycle could have easily coped with it or any obstruction that could have been hidden inside the puddle. So the evidence didn't support his case and it was more, more probable that, that he had caused the accident by making an error in negotiating the puddle himself. But even if the claimant had been successful, the, the court went further and said that having completed the signed on form, the signing on form, that he was aware that there was an inherent risk in off-road motorcycling and that the risk of a concealed hazard in the puddles on the tracks was obvious. You, you might think pausing there that to find that, that the risk of a concealed hazard in a puddle uh, is arguably internally inconsistent, but nevertheless, under cross-examination, the claimant ac accepted that he didn't need to be warned that muddy water might contain submerged obstacles. He was an experienced endurance rider and he assessed himself as being competent as well as experienced. And so he, he'd struck a, a submerged object. It was his own fault. This was a well-run centre, the court found. It, it the, the group on the Enduro Day was led by an incompetent and experienced instructor and it was a reasonable decision for him to take an experienced group along the byway. And the, the court found that it was for each of the riders to decide for themselves how they were going to approach the endurance event. And it wouldn't have been reasonable for a detailed risk assessment to identify and guard all hazards. 
or, or indeed to instruct experienced riders on how to do that. That th this, I think, is probably where the judgment has most of its value. You can see, it seems to me, for these reasons, why the court found against the claimant. But it, it went further. Interesting, I think, because of its its agreement with the defendant's reliance upon the, the Tomlinson argument that an enduro day is a reasonable sporting or recreational activity and to require detailed risk assessment or instruction on, on how to avoid obvious hazards, hazards I'm sorry, would negate the experience of all of that. Deborah James and White Lion Hotel. This is a local case, a decision of his honour Judge Cotter, our, our DCJ here in Bristol. Uh, again, it, despite being a county court judgment, it, it seems to be one of, of cer certainly some pers persuasion. Andrew Evans again for the claimant, this time the defendant represented by Ronald Walker QC. It, a sad case, this one. The, the widow and personal representative of the deceased sued the, the hotel's partners for damages arising out of a breach of the common duty of care under the Occupiers Liability Act 1957 after her late husband had fallen from a window and died. And it, it was suggested on his behalf by her that he'd either been lying in the bed or sitting in the windowsill either smoking or, or seeking some fresh air after a, a wedding the previous day. I've set out the dimensions of the window there because the court found them to be important in light of an argument which the defendant run in, ran, I'm sorry, defending the claim. I've set out the dimensions there for you. Importantly though, the, the, the window sash was faulty and it had to be held open and that's what the court found the claim was doing. It, also importantly, the partners were prosecuted in the criminal law for Health and Safety at Work Act offences. They appealed that conviction to the Court of Appeal uh, unsuccessfully. And so you might think that that finding would have had a bearing on Judge Cotter's factual findings in the civil case. And, uh, and it, or I should say his findings in the civil case, and it, and it did. Ronald Walker for the defendant saying it in response that the claimant had in, in effect taken upon or was responsible for his injuries himself relying on the Christian Lewis and Six Continents Court of Appeal decision where in that case a hotel guest had fallen from a second floor window in a hotel after he'd lent out of it and the Court of Appeal there said that that the hotel wasn't liable as it wasn't foreseeable that a, an adult would lean out of the window in such a way such that the occupier in that case would have been under a duty to limit the way the window opened. And on relatively limited evidence that Judge Cotter found that the claimant was, or the deceased I should say, was unlikely to have been lying on the and he was more likely to have been sitting on the window sill holding the bottom sash open and he'd lost his balance at some point and fallen. And the partners the judge found had accepted by their guilty pleas a reasonably foreseeable material risk of harm to adults holding the or falling from the sash window because it was low to the ground in the room and that they should have risk assessed that. The consequence of the risk assessment being that they would have installed opening restrictors and it was obvious Judge Cotter found that sash windows were designed to be opened and guests on upper floors might try to smoke out of them. And it, he, the judge, said the, there wasn't any significant social value to the opening of a lower sash that needed to be balanced against the fitting of open restrictors. So there, there was a foreseeable risk of serious injury or indeed fa serious or fatal injury and there was no social value of or to the activity leading to the risk and it could have been done or preventative measures wouldn't have cost the defendant very much. Had the deceased doing what he was doing again, the Ronald Walker running the Novus Actus argument here, he was leaning out the window, did his actions break the chain of causation? He, he'd been acting voluntarily doing that. Uh, it was clearly a misjudgment on the on his, the deceased part, the judge found, but it was something that other people might have done. And so on a narrow margin, 
and I'm not surprised it was on a narrow margin here, but nevertheless, it didn't break the chain of causation. And so it was still as a direct result of the failure by the, the hotel partners to fit window restrictors to the very low window. So it seems to me that, that in circumstances where the deceased doing something which was fraught with danger, the court nevertheless found a way to hold the occupiers liable. And the judge gave short shrift to the defendant's argument that in smoking in the room, he had made himself a trespasser and such that the defendant owed no duty to him. And the court quickly rejected that as an unattractive argument it found though it said there might be circumstances where smoking altered the status of a visitor, it, it didn't limit the duty, giving the example of smoking causing a fire hazard. I mean, you, you might think that smoking in a hotel bedroom may in and of itself cause a fire hazard, but nevertheless, the judge didn't wear that attempt by the defendant to absolve itself of any liability. So just to bring us all together, putting those threads together, I, I think those cases show that appeal courts are still reluctant to interfere with an assessment of the evidence by a trial judge. Defendants have been enthusiastic about arguing that claimants or third parties uh, actions have broken the chain of causation, albeit with mixed success. You don't necessarily get home as a claimant if you prove a failure to risk assess or, or to provide adequate induction training in the Harry's case. You've still got to prove that those breaches are causative and it's important that claimants have experience in the task that they're undertaking before they go about what is said to be in breach of duty to them. As well as the court saying a defendant's got to take a claim as they find them. That a serious psychiatric injury can sound significantly in damages and that there's no uh, duty to guard against obvious risks. So thank you very much for listening to me, I should have said at the outset that you, you have time now, should you wish to, to answer me questions. I'm just going to have a look at the Q&A bar. If I can load it up, I, th I think, oh, where's it gone? There it is, I've got it. Oh no, have I? There, sorry about that. No, it doesn't look like there's any questions. Thank you very much for listening to me then over your lunch hour. Uh, and I wish you all a good day. Thank you.